This is the law. Live audio wrestling. With the latest news, info, and interviews from the world of pro wrestling. Mixed martial arts. And the best of combat sports worldwide. This is the law. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Tidwell and Grady Weta. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the law. Live audio wrestling. And you are, man, can you hear it in my voice? Can you hear it in my voice, ladies and gentlemen, this week? Because, listen, anybody who knows me knows that I am a huge, huge Iron Maiden mark. So shout out, shout out to Zane for putting together that intro for us this week. That is incredible. Keep them coming. Keep those, keep them coming. All right. This week, we are going to sit down. We're going to talk a little bit about the fights that happened last night. I'm talking about the boxing between Tyson Fury, Francis Ngannou for the baddest, uh, the baddest man on the planet or the baddest, yeah, who will... Because, I mean, that's the thing that we're doing now. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, of course, we are going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation with one of my most favorite human beings in the world. I'm talking about the Blue Meanie, a guy who has seen every single company from the inside and out. ECW, WWF, WWE, whichever, what you know what I mean? And not to mention the grind that he still has going. So we're going to sit down and have a conversation about that. Uh, Please stick with us the entire time. We're going to have a good time, man. I am am in party mode this week. This Iron Maiden stuff has got me pumped up this week, ladies and gentlemen. So with that being said, I know that I can can tell he's just rocking in the free world in the background right there. Let me introduce to you the man who is with me each and every week, my ride-or-die my alibi, Mr. Braid Eye of the Wet Ham. How are you today, buddy? Ooh, it's me, ghost from your bed. Wait, that's Christmas. Uh, well, happy Halloween, my friends. Welcome to the law, live audio wrestling. I am Brady Wetham, and thank you, Notorious TID, for having me back once again as your co host. Partner in crime, what kind of criminal activity have we been up to this week? Well, you know what? It's been a crazy week. There's been a ton of fights. There's been a ton of activity. There's been a ton of stuff going on, getting ready for uh, NXT's night two coming up of Halloween Havoc. Uh, NWA went the Halloween theme as well with Sam Hain, one of their shows uh, happening this past weekend. Um, and, and, and you know, it's always, it's always crazy, like halloween stuff do you do halloween do you dress up do you go out trick-or-treating because you're still like you could put on a costume and be like oh look he's just an extra large child do you do you do this because i can't get away with it at almost 40 years old no but i would be lying if i said that at 25 i didn't throw a mask on and try it and it worked yeah, I mean, you haven't grown since 25. It's not like you're no. walking up. You know, you just got to put on the voice, right? It's not like oh, you're going to walk smaller. up with this one and go, trick or treat. No. <laughs> I used to do that when I was like, when I actually was young, because I've always had this voice. I've had this voice since I was 11. I don't know. My parents were like, what is happening? He's He hasn't grown at all since he was six, but somehow he has the voice of a radio man. That That is a crazy thing. You're lucky in that sense. Because I don't have that. I don't have that voice. I don't have. I've never been that. Hey, everybody, it's time and temperature Joe here. You but you know? score higher on me on the radio scale. We've done a bunch of radio tests uh, throughout the network, and you have a much higher score than I do. It's it's straight up intimidation. Yeah, I probably uh, that's pre- really what it was. I got a I got a handle on the people that you sent those uh, those 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 reports out to. For them to get back to you i found their addresses i went to their houses and uh i i i might have threatened every one of them it may or may not have been uh, from one or two of both of the big communication companies so you must have uh, some threatening demeanors to you to to reach both sides of the table 
Well, you know, you just send them one clip of you and cops and let them know that that could be you next. And you'd be surprised how much they bump you up in that algorithm. Uh, <laughs> well, speaking saying. of speaking of clips, we can't really talk about it on this show. But if anybody follows you on social media, you went viral this weekend, which is really cool. So uh, check out Notorious TID <laughs> at Notorious TID on all social media and you will find out what we mean. Um, otherwise, OK, so we had a really crazy boxing event yesterday. Dude, this what? was unreal. I know I texted you and I was like, hey, I think they spent 30 million. I actually found out the number. They're estimating about 300 million. Yeah. Yeah, I was off missed, a zero. You missed a zero on that because 30 Three. million that they spent would have been less than what Tyson Fury was bringing in for that fight. 50 million. Supposedly. That is the rumor. That is the rumor going around, obviously, because of where it was. Unless they're willing to give up that number, we'll never know. No, I don't think they'll ever tell us. Nobody will ever know what it is, right? So what we're talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about the battle, the battle for the baddest man on the planet took place, and this was a boxing match between the lineal champion, Tyson Fury, uh, taking on a, a man who has never had a professional boxing match, boxing fight, boxing bout, but is a former UFC heavyweight champion who never lost the title, just held out uh, for money and then, you know, um, got let go from his contract. And in doing so, he ended up over uh, signing this fight with Tyson Fury. So it was a fantastic, like when in this world, in this world of where we have like, like all of these um, crossover uh, uh, boxing fights, you know, because we can't call them the, the social influencer fights or the crossover fights where you've got boxer versus MMA guy. We just saw it not too long ago, right, with um, with Logan Paul taking on Dylan Dennis. I mean, if you want to call it, they were standing inside of a ring. It wasn't much of a fight. We've seen it with his brother, Jake Paul and New. Ben Askren, you know, and, and um, Tyron Woodley, you know, a couple of times now and with, with Nate Diaz, we've, we've seen this happen. We've seen these crossover fights. Well, and we've seen them all the way back to like Anoki and, you know, Ali Muhammad and, Ali. And then yeah. we've seen Tony versus, uh, Tony versus um, old man there. Oh, uh, Randy, Randy, Randy Couture. Couture. Yeah. Yes. We've seen yes. some, some crossovers. Absolutely. But we've never seen. Okay. So the closest we would have come to this would have been, um, would have been Connor and Couture. And no, would have, no, no, I'm saying size wise. Oh, size-wise, Connor, yeah. Connor and Floyd, Connor and Floyd is still, you know, those are, those are small dudes. What about you Mercer know, and Sylvia? Right? Okay. That's listen, size. What? Listen, <laughs> Are you surprised that I brought that up? Listen, that is when we're talking about heavyweights and champions and the caliber of the two people in their respective fields. And we're talking about the 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 level of which they are in the game. All right. James Tony versus Randy Couture was not there. Okay, Mm -hmm. Tim Sylvia. Ugh. Not there. Oh, poor we're, Tim gets no talk- respect anywhere. Ever. Ever. We're talking. We're talking about the current lineal champion in Tyson Fury, right? Uh, taking on a guy who is the UFC champion, not just the UFC champion, the guy who holds the record, holds the record for the hardest punch in all of combat sports all of it all of it recorded yeah we're talking we're talking boxing we're talking mma we're talking bare knuckle nfl you know what i mean well i don't know if nfl qualifies (laughs) as a combat sport have you seen it lately (laughs) jesus we're talking about tobogganing like (laughs) what fucking downhill skiing bruh (laughs) have you seen downhill skiing in newfoundland 
Okay. It's a combat sport. Could you imagine if they did that like in those old eighties movies? I know we're getting sidetracked here. No, I like it. Let's do it. Imagine, you know, those old eighties movies like up the Creek and down the mountain and stuff like that, where, Mm. you know what I mean? Where Mm. you gotta, you gotta, you, you go away on a vacation and then eventually the, the bully has to have a downhill ski event where they race down the mountain together. Like it was like, they're the cars in Greece. It's just Huey Lewis instrumentals playing the entire movie. (laughs) That that is the next level of sports between that. And you know, what comes after that running man, we're full on running man uh, live and in color on pay-per-view. And I'm all for that. Listen, if we're going to do combat sports, let's do running man. They should bring back. Remember that show in the two thousands. It was around WCW. I think WCW actually kind of worked with them. It was like a terror dome or something. It was like these, a, a mix of American gladiators and wrestling. You don't remember that? And it was, they had uh Terry Cruz was on it. He was T money. Oh my goodness. Wow. But they were like, it wasn't a work. Like they were, they were going in there and doing like the American gladiators things, but with wrestling personnel, it was a great show. I'm going to have to find, well, I'll talk about it next week. I'll find it. Well, I mean, they did it to okay. an extent as well, because remember when they did pros versus Joe's, that was a on, great on, show on Spike TV or whatever. Right. And they had MMA guys in yeah. there doing that thing. Well, this is what, you know, this elevated to the different level where you take you take somebody completely out of their element and you throw them you throw them in with somebody uh, who is at the top of their game inside of that element. Now, that's what we were seeing. This is the desert version of pros versus Joe's. This is exactly it. This is what I'm saying to you, Brady. All right. I'm into it. So they took somebody who, you know, as much as like he might hardest puncher in the world. UFC champion who never lost his title. Yep. And you're throwing him in a boxing ring inside of a boxing atmosphere, like so much so that like even you knew that when, you know, Sweet Caroline started playing right after that, because it's a boxing tradition, the intro, like that's when the the big entrances start happening. All the big uh, boxing events, as soon as they play Sweet Caroline, right after that, we're getting to the entrances for the for the main event. Now, before that, we had the whole event take place out in the parking lot. See, this is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm setting up the event, and then we're going to talk about this because this is crazy to me, dude. What is crazy? So you had you had this event that was headlined headlined by a UFC champion against a boxing champion. Yes, sir. that they gave absolutely like the line going into this. The line going into this was like. Minus fourteen hundred for At Tyson one. Fury, yep. and minus eight or plus eight fifty for Francis Ngannou. Yep. Even even the the betting world was like, this is crazy. They knew how one sided this whole thing was. Now, this is the beginning. Okay, this is the beginning of the Riyadh. Uh, I want to say the Riyadh Festival. You know, Riyadh Days, as they were to, they call they're calling it there. And Dubai they, Wonderland. They, they have this well because they're just launching this thing. They've got one. I mean, they've got one of those big globes. Yeah. You know what I mean? The sphere yeah. thing on water. Yeah, what they've, they've got done there thing. is is just one of the craziest things I've ever seen. I, I didn't know that that's what they were doing. This built, arena, this arena, Eden. the kingdom arena that they built there. They built this thing in 60 days. Can you believe that? It, it takes us longer to build a website. Yeah, I've been working <laughs> on a. I've been working on a new S M E website since January. Man, I've got a. I've got a bathroom that I haven't painted in fifteen years. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. It took them it. sixty days to put up an entire arena. Not just an arena, an arena where you could do an Olympic show in. Like, and not just an Olympic show, like at Olympic Games. I mean, like an Olympic opening because they attempted it as best they could with a really bad sound guy. But if that wasn't enough, what they did, what they did was they set up the prelims. You know, you could have had these things inside of there, but they had this thing set up inside of the arena. They had these gigantic monster video walls and this big, huge, like, um, um, horseshoe kind of stage coming off of it and then this giant circle in the middle and you're like what how where there's no ring 
what kind of fighting are we doing here? There's no ring inside of this arena. And then they told you very quickly because they showed you where they were doing all of the prelim fights. We're going to set up a secondary arena the size of like, remember when they used to do outdoor boxing at Caesars Palace? Yep. Like that, you know like what I mean? Outdoor WrestleMania. That's exactly what it was. It was the outdoor thing, right? And And they did this out the back doors basically of this arena they set up a smaller outdoor arena that when they showed when they showed the overhead shot of this outdoor you know area that they set up you were like how gigantic is that arena that they just built massive it is disgustingly huge so they have this set up folks they have this thing set up and they have the prelims outside beforehand and Tyson Fury and his management team and the, um, the, the, the chic uh, Turk. Uh, I want to, I want to make sure that I get his name completely right because Tur- uh, Turkey, Turkey, Abdul Musen. Yeah. Right. Al Sheik. He is the guy in charge there. He is the guy who basically had all of the celebrities coming in. On this thing, he's the guy that fronted the bill. He's the guy in charge of this Riyadh Days, um, the festival that they're doing. Uh, Shout out to him. I mean, fantastic. Changing the game. Dude. Dude. Changing the game. 100% changing the game. Because if you saw, like, you were watching the fights outside the prelims, all heavyweights. Yeah, it was, that was weird. That that's the very first time I think I've ever seen a card that was even balk out of any combat sports that was all heavyweights. And and dudes getting after it. Yeah. Like big fights. Big fights. If that wasn't enough, you're asking yourself, why didn't they do this inside? Well, because they had it set up inside because they were going to do this pre-show in between the 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 prelims and the main event. What that, a disaster. Okay, so talent aside, uh, because I see what you're saying, right? Because the talent that they had there, I had no idea. Maybe it's just me. I had no idea who any of those folks were. I've heard their name once. There was no mention. There was no mention of their names. There was no, there was no like um, um, pop up. You know what I mean? On the screen while they were playing to tell you who they were. There was no introduction before they actually started playing or whatever. I assumed, right, that the first person that did it was an English trap rap star because that's the music that it was. It wasn't English trap. What was it then? You can call it. It's a mix of it sounded like it was. I don't know. It was like a mix of English. Okay. Well, if you don't know, then that's what it was. Okay, well, we'll go with English trap then. Because yeah. <laughs> trap is crap. I'll shut I'll okay. my Irish trap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Trap. Yeah. Well, you had no trap. idea who it was, but you know what? It didn't matter to me. It didn't matter to me at all because I'm watching this. Yes. And the screens that they had in front where they're shooting through and 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 visually, all I kept thinking to myself was, you wait till the NFL halftime gets a hold of this technology. Well, they said that came from the NFL halftime people. No, this is this no, is beyond so the the people who directed and set up that the his excellence brought them in, and they're the same people who did the Olympic opening and the direction of the Super Bowl halftime show. So they're the ones that kind of headed this thing. This is advanced it's beyond a, what you ridiculous. saw. Yeah, beyond what you saw. This is huge advanced. Yeah, and I'm watching this going. This looks. Fantastic. I could watch this with the sound off on and 8K. This just as great. Imagine that in a theater, like in an IMAX theater. Unreal. Like, All right, let's do this. Unreal. So, so moving on, we've got we've got the craziest yeah. outdoor. I, I don't even know if they're considered prelims. I, I yeah. think because that was the card. It was the card because they just had you go come inside for one fight yeah we had a few knockouts i do want to right. run down the card real quick like is it what is your highlight what was your highlight fight of the the night of the, outside of the main of the prelims i, I guess the prelims yeah uh, um watching um abel day um get humbled okay um that was probably my favorite one and then of course you know um 
seeing Parker in the ring was always nice because there's a heavyweight who's a contender. You know what I mean? There was some, there was some crazy big dudes. Uh, the, yeah. the, I think it, what was it? The second fight. I don't uh, know who, what his name is, but that crazy Russian boy. The, that, yeah. The get Magomedov. out of boxing and come over to MMA, my friend. Wow. Twitch and all like bring it on over. Cause that yeah. dude has got some crazy power that yeah. comes from nowhere because the shots that he was throwing didn't look like they were anything. No, he just got, he has right? ham hocks, but this is the thing with heavyweights. So if you get a chance to go back and watch this, please do so because you'll you'll enjoy the heck out of it. Now follow now, Eminem indoors. Follow Eminem. Follow. Uh, oh, you sent me the list. Uh, yeah, should I pull it follow, up? Do you have it? Follow Kanye. Kanye goes up. Follow. Um, who else did we have in there? The Undertaker and Vince McMahon show up. Yep. Right. They're part of they're part of the list. Ronaldo who just, you know, scored. He just played earlier in the day, like before the fights and then scored a couple of goals. You know what I mean? And then boop, showed up there, um, you know, Connor McGregor, right? McGregor? Uh, McGruber. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, dude, Connor McGruber. That would be the that would be the worst human on the planet. Connor. Connor was very overly excited to be there it seemed like you said cocaine wrong <laughs> i did not i did not we don't know that it could have been his prescription for adderall uh, it go, could have been go a watch he go watch have... the interviews after the fights you'll know exactly <laughs> i know you were busy after the fights last night Ooh, but uh, you should go back and watch those connor interviews oh man my goodness this man him. knows how to feel good not just him mike tyson Oh yeah. Um um uh uh Sugar Ray Leonard. Um who uh who else was everybody was there? Was there. Larry Lewis. Holmes. Yeah, Lennox Larry Lewis. Larry looked good. Larry Holmes was there, right? Now now Larry uh Larry probably had the best night in the past 25 years. And and said straight up, said straight up, none of these guys. I whoop both their asses. I love Larry, man. Best jab in the game, baby. I love me some Larry Holmes. And that was, listen, listen, I'm going to tell you a little secret right now, because as a kid, that was the era that I grew up on. Yeah. Throw that weight on him, Larry. And, and, and I always said, I've always said in fights, in boxing, especially jabs, win fights. Yeah. And it's because of, and it's because of that man right there. It's because of Larry Holmes. Because that dude. Nastiest jab. Nastiest jab in the world. Right. It wasn't like your George Foreman's who would just throw a lunchbox at you. You know what I mean? Or Muhammad Ali, who would like not a big puncher, but he would pepper you enough. Roy would pepper you anymore. with weird ones from right? all angles, but they but, were like weird jabs off of like yeah. the weirdest places. But yeah, no, Larry just stuck it in your face and said, this is ha- have fun with your nose. Try to smell that afterwards. Right. That's so all he got- did was flatten noses. Well, yeah. And I mean, it makes sense that after that, he would live in a town like Hershey, Pennsylvania. Why is that? Oh, the, just a lovely smell of chocolate after oh, victory after victory. Oh, I mean, can you imagine idea. that? Good idea. Yeah. <sighs> so we so had Larry, we had Evander Holyfield, we had Lennox Lewis, you had Oscar De La Coca. There's cocaine again. That's who Connor was hanging out with, probably. You had you had Israel Sonia. Yeah. You Usman? had you had Usman. You had Alexander Usyk, who is definitely there because he has an invested interest because they leaked before the fights that it's already been thrown down for millions and millions of dollars that Tyson Fury is going to be fighting Usyk right back in that very arena in December. December. Yeah. So this is how much disrespect the entire boxing industry put on the name Francis Ngannou. Disrespectful. Completely disrespectful. Now, we can't be disrespectful. We should take a sponsor break, and when we come back, let's, let's talk about the main event, the yeah. uh, floor rising ring, um, and everything else that happened with Francis versus Fury. Absolutely. This is The Law Live Audio Wrestling, and we'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. This November, get ready for a face-melting, riff-raging, ear-blasting, rock and roll extravaganza. Monster Trucks Dive Bar Tour 2023 Ontario Edition. November 24th, the Dominion House in Windsor, Windsor, Windsor. 
November 25th, the Harb in Owen Sound. We'd sell you the whole seat, but it's standing room only. Get your tickets today at fanatickets.com. Shout out to all of our sponsors. This is The Law, live audio wrestling right here. You are listening to us, and we are talking about the baddest man on the planet fight that took place between Tyson Fury, the lineal champion of all of boxing, against the hardest-hitting man, Francis Ngannou, coming out of the world of MMA. Now, you've listened to, to us up to this point talk about the the all of the heavyweight fights that took place before this. Or they muted Not, us and just, you know, skip, make skip sense. forward. They wouldn't do that. Maybe mute me. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about the arena. We've talked about the star power. We've talked about the fact that now we have moved everything from outside to inside for one fight. This is the biggest spectacle you've ever seen in all of boxing. The money being thrown around on this, okay? The initial, I know that you and I were talking beforehand, and you were like, I think they spent like, what'd you say, $30 million? I thought throughout the day before I really got, this is before the concert even happened. Yeah. I'm like, I heard they spent $30 million. This should be. And I was like, no way. No, $300 million. Yeah. 300 yeah. of them. Yeah. And now, here's a deal. Could you imagine? Okay, hold on a second. Let's say you're sitting. Imagine sitting in a room. With 300 people, that's a hell of a crowd, right? 300 people knowing that every single one of those people is a millionaire. Mm -hmm. That's how much money they spent on lights and bad rap and flying people in. Oh, they flew everybody in. <laughs> and like, they flew everyone in. There, there had to be at least 20. I saw that there was a group shot. There was a group shot of of uh, the uh, the the man of the hour, His Excellency, uh, his indubiousness, yeah. uh, with the crowd of all the boxers and fighters. You know what I mean? Um, and there was Jesus, at least twenty to thirty five professional boxers alone that he brought in for this thing. Well, they said there was a who's who of everyone. He just he put out an invite, and if you were at that status or knew someone that was at that status, you were on a private jet on the way to Dubai. Here's the one thing that with Dubai is I believe that they that it's put out there so much so that Dubai looks like the kind of place and puts itself over as the kind of place where uh, pores don't exist. Here's a deal. Can we petition this show to move to Dubai? Would you move to Dubai if I got us a deal in Saudi Arabia? Yes, bye, Dubai, goodbye. Like, <laughs> I'm already there, 100%. Okay, guys, hashtag, uh, if you're talking about the law online, hashtag, the law goes to Dubai. Oh, I'm in. Let's do that. 100%. Let's, Let's... petition to sell this show to 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 our friends in Dubai. Maybe we can move into uh, one of these like crazy bubbles. We, we can cover UFC, Crown Jewel, and everything that we need to cover from right Whoa. there anyways. Well, I think everything's going there. It, it looks that way. Before we get into that, let's go. Let's backtrack. Yeah. Let's backtrack. So we have a very over-the-top entrance. They flew out Michael Buffer. You know, we had some uh, let's get ready to rumble action going. That was five grand right there. Five grand? He's a million. No, just for that phrase. Oh, yeah. Shit, I'm not allowed to say it. <laughs> yeah, no. So we're going to need you guys to send over some donations. Uh <laughs> we really need to go to Dubai now just to make up for me saying uh, uh, we might need to go to Mexico first because yeah. uh, we got to get away from these uh, these these bills. I was talking about the Sega Dreamcast game. That's what I was talking. That's about. right. That's hey, right. Best boxing games on Sega Dreamcast. <laughs> yeah, Let's they brought out the they brought out everybody. And we had some some drawn out and you know entrances. It was too much. These guys finally, like I think they I probably enough. ran about a half an hour to forty minutes late than yeah. what they were supposed to be. I was screaming at my computer saying at about yeah. six forty five. I'm like, it's gonna be friggin' nine thirty by the time these guys touch gloves. It's unreal. Yeah. So unreal. they finally I mean, made their way in. 
Yes. Um, Pretty Lady was a thing, or uh, was it? Yeah, it's Pretty Lady. What is it? What's that song? My, what's the song? Which one? Pretty Woman Walking. To, that's Pretty Woman, right? Yeah. Not Pretty. Yeah. Roy Orbison. So he does the the whole Pretty Woman. Yeah. Entrance. Pretty Lady is what a bird says. That's a pretty lady. Ah, pretty lady. <laughs> that's a pretty lady. So he did his little his little dance, uh, which I respect, and made his way to the ring. That is Tyson. Yeah. Um, Francis looked nervous. Francis looked like he was like, oh, I'm. This is this is what happens when you're standing across the ring from a from a champion in his field and you're going into his field, into his yard, you can tell it's the same kind of thing that you see a lot of times from a lot of fighters on that first time out. We saw the same thing when, when, when Connor fought Floyd Mayweather, you know what I mean? It was that, Oh shit, this is, this is real now. And I'm across the ring from the best of the best in my weight class. There were so many things from the second that Francis got into the ring to the second he left the ring at the end of the night, that reminded me from so many different scenes from the first four Rocky movies, but all different things that don't relate at all. And the first one, I won't ruin anything, but the first one was when he was walking around the ring, I had the same feeling that I had as a kid watching Apollo walk around the ring while James Brown was singing Living in America behind him. <laughs> It was the same kind of okay. where I was like, something doesn't seem right. This is, I don't think this is going to go well for Francis. Something just seems off. It's the middle of the movie. Even the first round. Okay. After they get into the ring, even that first round, Francis was throwing some, throwing some stuff where it was like, what are you doing? Are you, you're, he, he would throw a shot and it was like a patty cake shot to the shoulder. And it was like he was just like in he it was almost like he was in an exhibition or a sparring, you know, uh, a contest there with Tyson Fury as opposed to a real fight in that first round. Now, that said, when that second round came around, he started moving around. He was like, all right. And he started tagging him a little bit. And Tyson Tyson didn't look like he was on his game either with this. No, so it's almost like it's almost like the two of them went out and stayed out too late last night in Dubai before their fight today. Maybe, you know what I'm saying? Jet like, like kicked in both at the same time today. Right. Yeah. Something was something was off. And then and then you could see in his eyes in about that third round that Tyson Fury was like, oh, this guy is way stronger than anybody i've ever been in here with i'm gonna have to like start using my skills uh and then that fourth round came around i believe it was third, third. Wh- where he got oh, the third yeah, round third, yeah third. where he got where he gets knocked down he got tyson pretty hard. fury gets knocked down by an mma fighter and it was at that point that you saw when tyson fury gets up everything in his eyes was like oh this could be really bad if i don't start like taking this shit really seriously because the guy I'm supposed to fight next for more millions and millions of dollars, who's a much better boxer than Francis, much smaller, but a much better boxer. Oh yeah. And we've a- seen what we've seen, what Usyk has done to other guys. He's a killer, right? He's a killer. So Tyson had to get onto his horse a little bit and try to do some stuff. Here's the problem that I saw throughout the fight. He couldn't muscle Ngannou around. The no. only thing that he had over Francis in those later rounds was gas, was boxing cardio, which is a different kind of cardio. And you take nothing away, but Francis Ngannou is a champion. He's been in there, you know what I mean, in MMA fights with clinching and grappling and weighing on people for, for, for five rounds. And Tyson does a lot of that in his boxing fights where he'll lean on you and put you in guillotines and and try to use his gigantic 6'9", you know what I mean, structure, 275-pound structure, and lean on the back of your neck to try to tire you out. And that works when you're a guy who has, you know, NBA player legs like Deontay Wilder, but it doesn't work against a guy like Francis Ngannou. Francis Ngannou was like, yo, I'm just going to slip underneath your arm here and slide to the side like we do in MMA, and I'm going to pop you a couple of quick little uppercuts. 
Yeah. Tyson Fury was in a fucking fight tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, last, last night, night I should well, say. Yeah. I guess because yeah. it's the it's actually tomorrow. Now you're just messing <clears throat> with me. If you're thinking about it, if it's it's yesterday, but it's technically tomorrow because it's there, be there, but it, we're it's yeah, we don't even know. There. We're not even talking right about now. That. You're crazy. As you're listening to this, it's tomorrow. Birds are real. Oh yeah, yeah, right. they're, craziness. Yeah. Bryce Mitchell. We'll talk either about way. Eventually. Either way, Tyson Fury was in a fight. He was in he a fight. Knew that he, he did was not, in a fight. He didn't expect this, and we can go into it, I guess, because it started around there. Did you see how much cheating was going on in this fight? There was the a few different of, incidences. The amount of holding, the amount of not incidents. letting go, the amount of, um, you know, Tyson throwing some cheap elbows like he was trying to be in an MMA fight with this. He did not look like he was at his peak performance. He did not look uh, good. And, and, and that's no... That's taking nothing away from Tyson Fury's abilities. I think that that is more of a testament in my eyes. Anyways, that's more of a testament to Francis Ngannou's skills and the fact that like there's nothing Tyson Fury could watch on Francis Ngannou boxing. There is nothing, no tape, no nothing. No, there's no history, no nothing. So Francis Ngannou had all of the cards to play on this night and he played them damn near perfectly but you know he knocked, you, he you, knocked down the lineal champion do you know who's like really responsible for this whole thing with francis and it's not tyson it's the it's the entire team behind francis perfectly yeah, yeah. perfectly got him ready for this do you know who dewey cooper is no Dewey Cooper is his is his coach that you've seen when he walks out. He's the guy with the big long dreads who's always pointing up at the sky. Yep. Dewey Cooper, if you look him up, people, Dewey Cooper is a former uh, world class kickboxing champion. Like we're talking Tyron Spong, we're oh, talking okay. like that level of like Dewey Cooper is the man shout out Dewey Cooper. Like he is the absolute stud of studs and what he's done with, with some of those guys down at the UFC PI and the training that he's, you know, been able to give some of the guys, especially a guy like Francis Ngannou. Yeah. Dewey Cooper knows a thing or three about striking. There's no doubt about that. Right. Um, he's got a hell of a coaching staff behind him. Francis Ngannou did. And that's not taken again. Not taking anything away from Tyson Fury, but I think that this, this, in my opinion, anyways, was the first time that, you know, because there's always been this talk, Brady, you've heard it. We've, we've said it, we've talked about it, you know, that whole boxing versus MMA talk. I'm proud of Francis, right? You could not possibly be more proud of somebody because these guys that went in there against Jake Paul, who's not even near the level. Because if you think about it, here's how math, here's how combat sports math works, ladies and gentlemen. Jake Paul smashed the hell out of UFC champions in his own weight class, but then lost to a guy who used to be a glorified uh, British version of himself in one Mr. Fury. No, oh, yes, yes, it's Tommy. Tommy Fury, the younger brother of... Tyson Fury. Yes. Tyson Fury goes out there with the heavyweight MMA UFC champion and barely, barely, and I mean barely squeaked out. And I'm going to call bullshit. I'm going to call shenanigans because at no time, okay, one of these judges. Oh, I, my goodness. One of these judges scored this Canadian. fight, scored this fight 95 to 94 for Ngannou. Another judge scores this fight 95 yep. to 94 for Tyson Fury. Yep. And the third judge, who might as well have been, you know, Adelaide Stevenson. Well, he was it had to have been the Canadian. Right? Scores the fight Smoking that 90, good. 96 93. Where were you sitting for this? fight up uh, he was outside in the parking lot still 
he was the one responsible for making sure, making sure that that fight between Tyson Fury and Alexander Usyk happens. Yep. That's what that tells me. It's already that dead tells in the water is, anyway. Is we saw we saw we saw a a decent boxing match get completely marred. Yeah. By the bullshit politics that always always seems to permeate into the world of professional boxing, giving it the stain, giving it the name, giving it the 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 black eye that it's had for so long because of corruption, because of collusion and because of bullshit like that. Yeah, that was one of the worst decisions I've ever seen. They know. I don't even care if you would if you, they would have done a draw. I would have been okay with that. I would have been okay with that because it's Rocky one. And everyone else would have that's ever seen a Rocky movie. They've been like, it's not even true, but I don't care. Give me Rocky one. But that messes up the plan because the plan already got leaked. The script already got leaked where they got to go back and do this in December. Plan's dead in the water anyway. Now the plan is dead in the water. Whatever pay-per-views they thought they were selling with that thing just got cut in half. Tyson Fury, unless he goes out there and lays that man out in one round. Mm -hmm. Has got a lot of splaining to do to the box. One hundred percent. He's got a lot 100%. of splaining to do to the boxing community. Yeah, the MMA community and the fight business community already knew Francis Ngannou is nothing to sleep on. That dude, that dude. Do you see what that dude did to Alistair Overeem? I don't care what form you're in. You're a noob if you thought that Francis was going to get slept in the first round. Tid called this a couple weeks ago. I don't know if it was on the show or not, but he goes, Francis is going to go out there and, and shock the world. And you're right. Yeah. 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 That's, that's exactly what happened. Um, I didn't think that he was going to get off to a slower start. I would have liked to have seen Francis get off to a little bit of a quicker start. He was, but I that. understand, yeah. but I understand like that is a, that is a gigantic stage staying standing across the ring from the biggest name in all of boxing today, today, because Floyd's not fighting. You know what I'm saying? So uh, listen, my hat is off. I it's not that I didn't have respect for Francis Ngannou before, but I have a whole new respect for Francis Ngannou now. And I I would love to see Francis Ngannou in there in the boxing ring again. Against, you know what? Give, give me Wilder. Me, give me give me Wilder and yeah. him. Or Joshua. Give me Anthony Joshua and him yeah. in England. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because it looks like it looks like Usyk and Fury is going to be a thing going forward. You know? Give me him and... Listen, give me him and Parker. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can see that, too. You know what I mean? What, what about the, the kid who shocked the world against Give Joshua? me him and... Uh, what's his name? Give me him and uh, Dillian White. Give me okay, Francis yeah, and Gondu and Dillian White. Like The Mexican kid, though. What about oh, the Anthony, uh, um, Ruiz, Andy Ruiz. Ruiz. Yeah, yeah, Ruiz. Give him Ruiz. You That'd know, be a good fight. Like, let him bang. Let yeah. him show he wants to box. He's proven. He's proven to me. He's proven to you. He's proven to anybody that watched this fight that he belongs inside of that boxing ring. I mean, he if knows you haven't what he's watched, doing. If you haven't watched this fight, go treat yourself and watch it. It it is uh the last couple of rounds are what you're gonna see is more of the cheating side. So you're gonna see things like so Tyson Fury, I think I caught on to something that he's been doing for a while. He is pikey, and my people are pikey. Oh, he's so a I pike. come from I come from a long line of fucking pikeys. All right, that's just what we do. We have done caravan. I did not like dogs. All right, <laughs> so I come I come from the pikey people. We're crafty bunch. I think I caught on to something that Tyson's been doing for a while. So when he does his stance, when he first comes out, he only does it at the very beginning. He starts wiping his gloves on his forehead. Mm -hmm. Well, he's been one of those guys where his, his coaches like to overly lather him. Tyson comes out every round, even if he's a stalling and he's stalling in the round, but he always comes out, wipes his head a few times and throws the jab and throws a right instantly. I think he's been throwing Vaseline in his opponent's eyes at the beginning of the round every fight. Now, I don't think it works. I think it works maybe once at a 20. But when it works, it looks like he just popped him in the eye and his eyes now hurting. It's not that 
I think I caught on to something. Then I also caught on Nagano, got a trick from Tyson. So Tyson had his arm broke, arm broken in the fight, one of his last fights against that big white boy, by by that uh, really weird clinch. The underhook. The, it's underhook, the underhook, and you pop it up. Nagano did it to to Tyson in round mm-hmm. seven or eight, and Tyson said it to him. He's like, "You, he's like, you son of a bitch." He knew exactly what he was doing. So mm-hmm. I think Tyson's arm is hurting pretty bad right now. And if you go back and watch that fight, I think you see his arm get wrenched a few times. So there was who, some cheating going on. Who knows? Who knows? We'll see if this December fight actually happens then. Yeah. It I might love, have to get put back. I love that they were talking shit too the whole time. I thought it was uh you because you don't see that too much in boxing. Not like when, that. When Francis Ngannou knocked him down and then stood over the top of him, he, I'm he, yelling at my TV going, get out of there. Let uh, him count. This is what happened to Deontay Wilder, you yeah. stupid asshole. I love how you were like, get out of there. And I was just like, get in his face more, Austin. I'll tell you what. Yeah. There Piss is. on him. Yeah. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Just just throwing up trombone symbols signals yeah, in the corner. He was about to do a backflip <laughs> off the ropes. It's like, no, man, you don't know. This is the this is the Undertaker. He gets Fran- up, yeah, dude. Francis and Ganu goes down for the spin a Rooney and yeah, like no. you know, like Kane sits uh, up when you're not paying attention, bro. One hundred percent, right? Like you gotta you listen, Tyson Fury is the real deal. That fight was the real deal. Um, I would watch the rematch. I'm telling okay. you right now, um, because I think that the rematch would be a little different than that first time out, because I think that both guys um, gained a whole new respect for one another and their abilities. And even more so, I think that uh, people learned a very valuable thing today or today, t- yesterday. This well, we're learning it from you today. Yeah, right. Learning it from me today and along with everybody else. And that 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 thing is is that a man like Francis Ngannou has basically manifested himself into a position to fight against the heavyweight champion of the world in his first ever boxing fight and did good. This was a rocky story. Did good. He won. He, well, you know what? He not didn't. on the books, but he won. He, he didn't. Not on the but, books. But, uh, you know. You know what I really think it was? I think it was DraftKings and Stake, and everybody called in real quick and said, hey, there's too many $2 parlays and $10 parlays that are going to lead to like a $100 million payouts. Well, yeah. We're going to lose me- our whole company. You mentioned you mentioned that because after that knockdown, okay, remember when I said at the beginning of the fight, the it odds. was minus 1,400 and plus uh, 850, right? After that knockdown from Nganu on Fury, the it went to uh Tyson Fury, I think was a minus two seventy-five. Yeah. And Francis was a plus two seventy-five. You like how I set you back up there and bring that back around again? Unbelievable. So it's insane. With that said, if you get a chance to go and watch that fight, go watch that fight. It is worth it. Um, we've got a lot of more stuff, but we're yeah. listen. We're up against it because it was so much, and I want to make sure that we've got time so that everybody gets a chance to listen to this interview when I had a chance to sit down with the Blue Meanie, uh, you know, coming up. So tell you Before that, before that, let's take a quick sponsor break. I was just going to say. We'll come back, and then we'll do a quick rundown. We'll take a few matches from Crown Jewel this upcoming weekend, and uh, we'll talk about those, and then we'll lead into your sit-down with Blue Meanie and go from there. Tremendous. We'll be right back. This is The Law, live audio wrestling. See you in a minute. Hello, special friends. You can catch Greg and Brad, your smack daddies, each weekend on the SNME radio network. We cover our lives, what's happening on the East Coast, and eventually cover SmackDown. Check us out each week at SundayNightsMainEvent.com. Please subscribe to get your Smack Daddies and the rest of the SNME Radio Network content directly to your podcatcher for less than a dollar a week. We the ones!
And we're back to the Law Live Audio Wrestling. You just got done hearing us talk about the big fight, and we're going to move on, and we're going to talk a little bit about an upcoming event, November 4th, in the same area. Yep. Okay. I'm sure that uh, who knows if Vince McMahon uh, is even going to leave Dubai. He might just I hang out for he the. Is. He might just hang out for a little bit, you know, uh, because they've got Crown Jewel coming up and this is an event that you know they do once a year worth millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars and i know that this one excited you a little bit brady yeah so tell me tell me this time around because we're seeing stuff open up a little bit more the women were allowed to wrestle Last time at Crown Jewel, you know what I mean? The leniencies are getting a little bit less and less on the arts and entertainment end of stuff, right? Which means that the WWE will hopefully, hopefully have the ability to go full bore, you know what I mean? With the things that they do. So what is it that you're seeing in this um, um, that gives you the indication that this is the Crown Jewel to Crown Jewel, all Crown Jewels? I don't think it's going to be the crown jewels oh, for all crown bad. jewels. No. Oh, shit. Uh, but I do think it's going to be a very stacked, stacked crown jewel. Um, they mm. are bringing in some, some, it's like they're setting up, they're doing more of the title thing than they are the big name. It's not like they're bringing in Undertaker and Goldberg and digging up Andre the Giant and all this other stuff that they do every time they go there. They have just jacked the card up. So, We'll go through matches, stuff like uh, Eo Sky versus Bianca Belair for the WWE Women's Championship. We've Great got to see like Bianca that. back. Yep, we have John Cena versus Solo Sokoa. Now, that's that's passing of the torch. That's what's going on here. Is John Cena came back to just give the rub to all these kids. Do you think Do you think he gives the rub by putting them over or just by being in the ring with him, though? Both. Both. Interesting. Yeah, I think he put Solo over. I think you see Solo over. I don't think it hurts him if John goes over. I think it's great to have John Cena go over in Saudi Arabia or Dubai or wherever you want to call it. But I think it go it goes into the good feeling, sell some merch, you know, keep his brand strong there. But you feel like he's going to go into Crown Jewel and do a Make a Wish for so. Solo. Yep. Okay. Yep. I think they need to build up Solo, and then uh, going out from that somebody they don't need to build up any bigger because he's pretty much, he's almost reached his peak. It's got to be uh, Cody Rhodes versus Damian Priest. So, well, we don't. Mr. America is back. Is this the I first, think... is this the first actual face that they've gotten over since Hogan that has been all about America? Because they tried with Lex, they've tried with a couple other people, they tried with Cena, never really worked. This one, I feel like this is the true all-American. I... Uh... Because Kurt was an all American, yes, but that was right. just because that that wasn't a but gimmick. That's my that proxy. Was true. Yeah, yeah that was that's my proxy. I mean. Like when you're when you're an Amer uh, an Olympic wrestler, yeah, right. Like that's your gimmick. You're automatically there. If you're hacksaw Jim Duggan, you're automatically there. If Jack you, Swagger, NCAA you know I mean? champion, yeah, yeah. Anybody who's got that kind of lineage before you get into it, if you're gonna if you're drawing your gimmick off of those things, then you're automatically there. Um, it's the first I mean, one that Cody, works. Well, and and is it is it because he's you know this rah rah American guy, and not in a Bryce Mitchell kind of way, but in a because he has a gigantic American flag tattoo on the side of his neck. <laughs> no, I don't think that's it either. <laughs> that was branding. I think that's why you see it on the WWE. No, no, it's a tattoo. Branding is completely different. Uh oh. <laughs> but yeah, we got we have Cody versus Damian. Um, I do think Cody is like they're they're that's their guy they're going to run with when they're done with la night sure and i'm but, telling you that's going to be a match in my opinion that's going to be a match that's going to be a lot better than it sounds or looks like on paper now speaking of guys that they're probably almost done with uh ray mysterio is putting up his united states championship against the one the only prime boy logan paul yeah this was something that we saw what we saw logan call out Ray after yeah. his boxing fiasco <laughs> against Dylan Dennis. That's the best that he could do. That that fight was so bad that he was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do a pro wrestling call out to try to give myself a little bit of steam yes, because sir. leaving here, I've got absolutely nothing. It was smart. 
it was smart business on his end. I mean, obviously they knew that this was going to happen. So he was like, ah, I'm just, I got nothing to talk about here. So let's talk about that. And then they ran with it. I think they caught, you know, they caught Ray Mysterio at a football game uh, in <laughs> LA or something like that. You know no, what I mean? And interviewed no, him. No. Yeah, they did. 100%. That's what they did. And, and yeah. And that's where the response came from. And, really? And then they made the match for it or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's listen. crazy because he just got himself a title out of booking his own shit because he's yeah. going over for that belt. Yeah. I crown jewel. Yeah. That's hundred percent. Yeah. And, that's happening. And, and listen, I'm okay with this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay course. with this because Logan Paul, Logan Paul has showed that his athleticism and his ability to learn and wantingness to learn the world of professional wrestling gives me um, a whole new respect for Logan Paul. And who better to do it in there with than Rey Mysterio, a guy who could, you know what I mean? He can do all of this with his eyes closed. Yeah. Your Logan Paul is going to be a fantastic base who's going to be able to hit some big things on Ray because Ray is a very, very strong individual a lot stronger than people give him credit for because of his size uh that's going to be a hell of a match i guarantee it next up we have seth freaking rollins versus drew mcintyre for the world heavyweight championship listen anytime that you've got seth out there you know that you're going to get a spectacular performance from him oh i thought you were going to say outfit and well you're going to get that too right Drew McIntyre has since coming back has done a fantastic job. Um, listen, they've done a good job of putting together these matches so far for crown jewel, um, which in this day and age is always got to be the toughest thing I can imagine. You know what I mean? Being able to try to come up with something new, something innovative and keep the storyline strong coming out of crown jewel, because we know, we all know that, you know, as much of a, uh, they try to keep the storyline strong through it. It's a one-off. Yeah. This is oh, a yeah. one-off show done specifically for rich people sitting on couches. Well, and this next match is, is a perfect right. indication of that because for the women's world championship, we have a fatal four-way match. Mm -hmm. Rhea Ripley versus Shayna Baszler versus Zoe Stark versus oh, it's fatal five. Fatal five way? Are we really just making up? It's got to be a six way or a four way. Really fatal five way? We're getting Rhea Ripley versus Shayna Baszler versus Joey Stark versus Raquel Raquel Rodriguez versus Nia Jax. Well, so I guess it is six way it's, then because because it's the it's the return of Nia Jax, right? Yeah, well, I guess it is a six way. You didn't sell that. I apologize yeah, no, for I'm, saying it yeah, twice. I'm not, I'm not putting that stuff over. I, I apologize for saying it twice. <laughs> I don't like her. Someone's going to get hurt. 100%. I hope it's not Rhea Ripley. No, I, I hope it's nobody in that match. And I all, actually, I don't even, I hope it's not. I don't, even, I don't want to see anybody get no, injured I, in a match. Nia That's Jax is, is one of those people that I think the name value has ran its course. I think she is uh, not very good at this craft. And I don't think that the heat that she brings in is the kind of heat that you want to get for any sort of heel. I think that I, if it was me, I'd pull her back a little bit. I'd make her a cooler. I'd make her somebody's heater. Okay. Going yeah. there. I'd make her somebody's, somebody's, you know, Kevin Nash. They I'd kind make of her somebody's big boss man. You know what I mean? Going into it, like, and just give her one or two things because I get it. She has a name value that you can draw off of. There's no doubt about that. Right. But um, do you think, I wonder if this is a, an indication because of Charlotte being gone, they need to have as many name value people inside of that division as possible. Well, and they're still and, waiting for Jade to, to get ready to make her proper debut. Once she makes her debut, I think you're off to the races. You've got some yeah. talent that you can carry on both shows. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But until then. And our main. Our main. Uh, this is really the only match I'm super, super, so stoked for. Now, I don't think he pulls it off because, like you said, it's a one-off show and they're not going to do it on this night. Right. Roman Reigns, the champion. Taking undisputed on. Disputed. WWE Inferno. Universal Champion. Taking on. Uh, Alex Brody. Oh. No. Uh, he's taking on. 
Yeah. He's taking on. Yeah. Yeah. He's taking on. Yeah. Oh. L. A. Night. Yeah. La Night. La Night. He's taking on La Night. La Night, the biggest, the biggest face. Uh, I would I would assume the most, the biggest organic face push forced one since Daniel Bryan where the crowd and the audience has forced this into the plans because I think Cody Rhodes was the guy. Well, and then we LA Knight came along and they're like, Oh damn. We all know how much the WWE crowd, the WWE universe loves a good sing along. And who have they had, uh, you know, in quite some time where they can play that game with where they can play the what or they can play the, you suck. There they can play the, you know, that 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 interaction, that back and forth. Where have they had that recently? Enzo was the last big one they had. Enzo. How long ago was that? A long a, a lot longer than people realize. So the fact that they brought back this that that kind of a gimmick, like it it's perfect for LA Knight. New Day did it uh the New Day was able to pull it off, but not in the same not not Theirs like wasn't this. a back and forth though. That was just the crowd, you know, new day with their music. Well, and they did like, the who, their who, thing, who, right? Who, which was more annoying than anything. Which, right? Absolutely, and they knew it was annoying. That was just them. It wasn't a back and forth with the crowd. Yeah. That was just something that the crowd would feed off of. With this, it's a it's a back and forth. It's that what and you know, I had one well, burger, I had two I, burgers, I had three burgers. You know, this is this is that whole thing all over again. And I think he's so damn talented and he's been around for a while now where he's picked he's picked up when he needs to pick up. Yeah. That he's got about four more of these in him. He just hasn't pulled them out yet. No. I love how he does all of his uh, promos are old lyrics from like Biggie Smalls tracks or like Tribe Called Quest. Like he's pulling out old lines from tracks from his childhood. Like this dude's in on it. He's he's in on it. And I think it. I think the I think the office is behind him. He gets it. And he's the next big guy. He gets it. Yeah. I think, I think, I think with him, I really like that. I really like the addition of Nick Aldis to the yes. WWE universe. Yes. I love that. He's, he's there now. Classy finally, gentlemen. And we're going to talk about him in the upcoming weeks. There's no doubt about it because I think that his brain is built for this business. Well, going from the blue brand, there's and no his doubt nice about it. Day blue, day blue suit. Day blue. His exactly. day blue suit. His debut blue suit. See, like you didn't even give me a chance to segue it from the blue brand. Oh, uh, well, I just took but it but me. you knew what I was doing. I know what you're doing because I'm looking yeah. at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a this is the a producers. Show. The producers are holding up the pencil. Yeah, and they're telling us to take that it red home, light's been flickering in my eyes. Yeah, and exactly. It's, just a, it's not even a light on the wall. It's just someone <laughs> with a <their> laser pointer. <laughs> that is unbelievable. So what we're going to do is we're going to take another quick break. We're going to get these bills paid, and when we come back, we're going to sit down. And listen to my conversation that I had, like I said, with one of the greatest human beings, a man who's seen it all, been around the world and back, probably one of the most lovable baby faces ever in the world of professional wrestling. Stay with us. When we get back, we're going to talk with the Blue Mean. SportCards.com, Canada's number one stop for WWE, AEW, UFC, NHL, NBA, and NFL hobby boxes. Total, Total Sport Cards always delivers the most sought after products with the best price points in the market that you can find. Keep your collection up to date Total. with TotalSportCards.com. TotalSportCards.com, proud sponsor of Sunday night's main event. And we're back and joining us now 
one of my favorite human beings on the planet no doubt about it mine and yours as well because if you know anything about this guy you know that you cannot have a bad thing to say about him this is a man who has been up and down the road this is a man who when you think of characters and you think of things like ecw wwe and even professional wrestling uh if this guy does not come to the top of your list you're missing out on something and you need to do more homework ladies and gentlemen joining me now the the blue meanie brian Hafron. brian how you doing today pal hey what's up tid man thanks for that uh really nice intro with the uh the paypal's on its way or venmo or whichever <laughs> former currency you take well I we're, send it, i'll send it in u.s funds yeah we're of the old school so you can just just throw a check in the mail <laughs> I'll give it a handshake through the <laughs> give it a handshake through the camera. You know, that's the, right. That's right. How old will that hot dog be by the time it gets there? Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll hold the toppings. <laughs> so let's get down to this because you're busy, um, and I want to get as much information out of you as possible. Yeah. Let's start. Blue yes, Meanie sir. is probably, in my opinion, one of the greatest characters of all time in wrestling. There's no doubt about it. Um, When this all came about and the blue meaning concept all came about, how open were you to it? Uh, How did it come about? You know what I mean? Who brought it to your attention first? And was there hesitation? Uh, The blue meaning character came about. I was in the business for about a year and a half. Uh, There was a, a series of shows I did once I left Al Snow's wrestling gym in uh, Lima, Ohio, Al Snow's Body Slammers Wrestling Gym in Lima, Ohio, to go back east. I kept running. There's three shows, one in Baltimore, West Virginia, and then Pittsburgh. I kept running into Raven and Stevie Richards. And uh, one after one of the shows, uh, Raven pitched the idea that they were thinking about doing a, well, Stevie was, Stevie Richards was Raven's lackey. And they wanted to have a lackey for a lackey, but kind of like a wacky kind of guy where, you know, he's a, you know, a fat guy who like tries to emulate Stevie. So he's wearing the half shirt and the day, the Daisy Dukes. And they had a guy in mind and the guy made me look small. If you can imagine that he, he towered over me, a big, big dude, but he wasn't a, a worker. He couldn't wrestle, couldn't take bumps. Uh, Raven watched me work over those three shows and saw me uh, do some stuff, saw me do the moonsault and. He, uh, you know, the day after the Pittsburgh show, he pitched me the idea of being Stevie's lackey. So uh, I, I kind of debuted October of 1994, but th- there was an incident with fire on the show, uh, which all that footage got canned. So along with it uh, came my debut. So in that in that meantime, uh, Raven, me and Raven were doing me, Raven and Steve were doing shows, and. Um, in the, in the meantime, you know, we're driving back from one of those shows and Raven goes, you know, Hey, have you ever seen the yellow submarine? It's like, yeah, when I was a kid, he's like, you remember the character blue meanie? I was like, is, vaguely sort of kind of, he's like, you're going to be the blue meanie. Uh, you're going to, you know, he's trying to pitch it hard to me. He's like, you're going to love it. You're going to, you're going to want to paint your whole body blue, but just do your hair for now. And I was like, Bob, I'll be in ECW. Right. He's like, yeah. I was like, I'm in, you don't have to sell me. <laughs> and then um november to remember 95 uh we went out and got the uh we got the half shirts we got the daisy dukes and uh my debut was to debut uh was to present steve richards with a present so at november november to remember 95 they had me sit in the crowd with uh, the rest of the audience and uh when stevie came out i you know jumped to my feet and got his attention. I handed him a package. And when he opened up, it was a airbrush half shirt that said flock of seagulls with a bunch of hearts and all that stuff. And uh, we embraced and he brought me over to guard rail. And, and in a lot of ways, that was my, uh, that was very uh, symbolic because I used to go to those DCW shows as a fan. And now I'm a professional wrestler and I'm being brought over to guard rail into a company and my life's about to change forever. You know? Did you think, did you think at any point, like, cause Raven's, w- we, we both know Raven and mm-hmm. his brain is like on 12 yes. at all times. You know what I mean? Did you ever think that this was, 
that this was a rib? Uh, kind of, sort of, but yeah. Uh, and you asked me about hesitation. There was a little bit of hesitation at first because you get in the. I was only in the business again. I was only in the business a year and a half. I started in June of ninety four, maybe, and um, first match in Canada, by the way. Um, but uh, yeah, you're thinking, all right, this guy's set me up half shirt daisy dukes dye my hair blue uh you know it could be a rib i and in the lot the, the comparison i use i you know, i'm in the back getting dressed and i kind of feel like howard stern in uh, the movie private parts when you see him uh dressed as fart man and he's walking through the backstage at mtv music awards and everybody's just looking at him like who's this <laughs> and ozzy goes what a jerk you know because you know there's his ass hanging out but uh it, it, it's one of those things, you know, you, you take risks, you lean into it, no risk it, no biscuit. I, right. I, yeah. You know, yeah. You, you, you know, think of dusty with the polka dots, even right. if it was a rib, he's like, I'm going to make this work. Right. And, right. uh, being a natural ham, you know, class clown, you know, everything I got in trouble for in grade school, I started making money with, you know, you know, my report card would come home from school. Brian keeps making fart noises in class. Well, now I'm on ECW doing the armpit. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it could have been a rib, but if it was, it paid off. You know, this, there's certain things. Sometimes you have to step out, outside of your comfort zone. So inside of the business, and I've talked, I can remember having a conversation with uh, Pat Tanaka one time mm -hmm. and we were talking about ribs inside of the business. He's telling me about AWA stuff, you know, and, and padlocking, you know, the, the boss's briefcase to the table and like, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and guys would come in, guys would come in, we you know, just with like missing eyebrows and, and, and some ribs, mm -hmm. some ribs back in the day were a little, a little fucking excessive, like H, like H bombing dudes on planes and stuff like yeah. that seems, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. that's, that's the equivalency of like, you know, date rape nowadays. It seems like, and you yeah. know, it's, it, it, it's insanity. Some of the stuff that these guys would get away with. What, what was the biggest and best or worst rib that you ever witnessed yourself or were a part of that you're ready to now confess to? Wow. Um, biggest rib probably, um, I don't know if there's any like huge ribs. Right. Uh, you know, um, yeah, my, my, I'm always, I was always about the harmless ribs. So like, uh, for instance, me and Al, me and Al Snow, mm -hmm. uh, my big brother, uh, we're, we're traveling on WWE and we're in somewhere in Connecticut. And we do the show, uh, probably, I think this is when, when Raw was taped, live Monday, taped Tuesday, go home on Wednesday. So uh, we go to the hotel, and uh, we go to our rooms. Uh, I'm going to take a shuttle bus in the morning. He's going to return to run a car. And um, I realized I had left my knee pads in the car. I, I put them in the back seat just to kind of air out. You know, because I don't want to put them in my bag and they get all, get the whole bag gross. So I, I was letting my air pad, my knee pads air out in the back seat. So, uh, I call up Al's room. Hey, Al, I left my uh, knee pads in the car. Can I come get the, the key? Go get my knee pads. It's like, yeah. So I go down to his room, get the key, go down to the car, go to the rental car, uh, unlock it, go in. Uh, I'm grabbing my knee pads out of the back seat and I go, <laughs> And uh, I, I was uh, alerted. I, I reminded myself of a rib I used to pull when I worked as a security guard in the casinos in Atlantic City. If I ever saw somebody who left their car window down, I would just reach into the car and turn the volume knob on the radio all the way up. <laughs> you know, it, it was a harmless rib. You know, I'm I'm not stealing change out of the you know right. out of the uh, cup holder or nothing. I'm just. You know, hey, you probably should have rolled up your window. It was a gentle reminder. You should have rolled up your window. But here I am. I I'm get my knee pads. I look over and I go over and reach over to the the stereo and turn the raw volume knob all the way up and leave it. Go back, give out the keys, go back to my room. And this is back in the day, early days of cell phones where, you know, you went to bed, you actually turn your cell phone off. 
So I turn my cell phone off, go to bed, set, set, get the wake up call from the hotel. Wake up, you know, the hotel wakes me up, get on the shuttle bus, go into the airport. I go, ah, shit, let me turn, let me, let me turn my phone on, turn my phone on. Oh, I got a message. <laughs> I, I call the voicemail and all you hear is music blaring and Al goes, meanie, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and a few other words. And he just cursed me out. But not only was the rib funny, but the fact was he turned on the car. He was startled to death by loud music. He didn't even bother turning it down. He just grabbed his phone, dialed my number, called me, cursed me out, hung up, and then probably turned down the music afterwards. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, half, so that, half the part of selling half the part of selling the rib is letting you know that all right, you got me. You got me. You got me. Did he ever receipt you on it? Oh uh no, Al never really I can't remember a time Al really ribbed me. Uh right. we we've always ribbed other people, you know. Uh yeah, you know, we're I was out of school and we're you know, we talking about blading and gigging and all that stuff. And uh <laughs> One day I, I go into the uh, restroom area, you know, everybody's in, everybody's for training or whatever. And, uh, I, I gig my forehead just for the f fuck of it. And then I slam something hard, really hard on the ground. And I lay on the ground and I'm laying there bleeding. Oh God, help. And Al's the first one in and he sees me and you see him go <clears throat> because he knows what I'm fucking doing. And then, uh, the other students come in like, oh my God, uh, you okay? Call an ambulance, call, and then I realized the ambulance just cost money. I was like, "No, no, no! It's a rib! It's a rib! It's a rib!" It's a, yeah, I don't want to get no bill. Uh, <laughs> as long as the money, if the rib doesn't involve somebody paying money, then it's a good. It's a harmless rib, right? Well, that was always the thing too. Is you know, you'd see guys, especially rental cars. Rental oh cars is just the like as soon as you're you know never ever. These are the things that I've learned from other people, not myself, because I wouldn't be so silly. Never ever let somebody else return your rental car right <laughs> you know right and get and, and, and get the coverage always get the insurance coverage uh, i i know of a certain uh guy who should should go nameless uh but you know his first name's balls and his last name's mahoney um <laughs> he uh he was lit i don't know what the deal was but like the headbangers like egged him on to destroy his rental car you're like oh you that's a rental you would you wouldn't you know take a bump on the the roof would you oh what dude huh ah, ah. it goes up on top of the car it takes a huge bump oh. oh. and then he has to take the car back to the rental place and he realizes he never got the coverage for the car the, uh, the full cover wow <laughs> so did, it's like uh he was on the hook for the uh the damage did the did the headbangers at least like pitch in a couple of bucks or something like that to help uh, them out? Of course not. Because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't phys they didn't physically touch the car. They just sure. uh, they right. coer the, coerced the power the, the power of persuasion, as it were, right? Uh, which didn't take didn't take much. <laughs> was but there ever a, a it was enough power to light maybe like a flashlight? <laughs> was there ever a guy in ECW that you just didn't rib? I can remember one time I'm standing backstage at an ECW show. I think it just might have been Buffalo or something like that. Okay. And I'm standing backstage and I'm having a conversation with uh with Tommy Rich at the time. Hey. <laughs> and, and we're just we're just shooting the shit, you know what I mean? And and just just having a casual conversation and and gang. One man gang comes, you know, walking by or whatever. And Tommy fucking says something to him without missing a beat. One man gang reaches into his pocket, pulls out a fucking knife, looks at Tommy and goes, I'll fucking cut your fucking throat right in front of this kid. And I'm just going, whoa, 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 what the hell's going on? Like, clearly they're just busting each other's balls at the time. Right. But it's, oh, of course, it, it, it's one of those things. Like, was there, is there ever anybody, anybody that you were just like, you don't go near him to rib him. And why was his name New Jack? Uh, hey, <laughs> amazingly enough, me and New Jack, how long? Great. I listen, I have nothing but nice things to say about New Jack. I never had any problems with him. I, I worked with him, you know, many, many times. I would I would work with Jack eight days a week. 
You mm-hmm. know what I mean? There was that first initial time, the first initial time when you meet him, you know, and, and you're sitting the, in the, the feeling room. out process. Yeah. Because you're sitting in the locker room and, you know, and he's gotten across the border and he reaches into his bag and he pulls <laughs> out this like 10 inch long knife that's connected to a chain and it's got a fork at the other end. And you're going, okay, this could go one of two ways, right? One of two ways. And I, I, I says to my, my, one of my tag partners, uh, at the time I was like, hand me the fucking dusters. So he hands me a a pair of knuckles and I put them in my Mm -hmm. pocket just, you know, because if this is going to go one way, this is going to go one way very badly. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We go out there, we're talking, you know, we go out there, we do the thing. The first fucking spot comes off. We go to the outside. Jack grabs a bottle, smashes the bottle, uses the end of the bottle and starts, you know, digging into my forehead or whatever. And I've, I've got my hand ready to go into my pocket. Like if this is, if this is going to go South, this is where it's going to go South and light as a fucking feather. Yes. Like could not possibly be more professional uh, at at that moment. And it was at that moment that I was like, cool, I will work with this guy anytime, anytime, you know, um, I I wasn't in ECW when, uh, ECW ran Canada, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, I think I was in there like right after. And, uh, I heard the story that, you know, they're at the, they're at the building in Canada. The first night I forget, I don't know which, where, where it was, but new Jack walks into the building and everybody's jaw hit the floor. Like, how did he get into Canada? Right. And they're like, Jack, how did you get into Canada? And Jack looks at him and goes, man, that water was cold. (laughs) (laughs) As if he swam across the border, which is amazing. (laughs) Huge pop. Yeah. I, I had similar situations. I worked with new Jack. Um, couple times in the uh once in east Ab arena and then uh when i came back in 2000 we had a match and easy as k yeah easy as, it, it's all how you approach people you know and you're asking you know who do you you know don't rib but, you know it's just you know there's you could rib somebody but you gotta get to know the person in order to rib them you know so like uh, you know i can say something to you know once me and jack got to know each other and and had a comfortability around each other, I could say things to pop them. And, and, you know, but if an outsider came in and said the exact same thing, then there, there's going to be trouble, you know, but we, you know, that we were like a family. Uh, somebody just posted a clip uh, on Twitter the other day where me and Nova, uh, Tommy Dreamer is getting beat down by Danny Doring, Jack Victory, uh, Michael Lazansky, and one other guy, I can't, uh, Lance Wright, and one other guy, I can't think of his name. And uh, me and Nova do the uh, New Jack, do the Gangsters Run in with the trash can. He's Nova Stapa, and I'm Blue Jack. And we're beating him up. And, th- and we're doing this because New Jack was injured. And he's not on the show, but he's at the show. And he's on top of the stage where the hard camera is. And we do the whole thing. And, uh, there's a moment where we're bringing the trash can full of weapons and we go to throw it in. Nova goes to throw it over the top rope. I go to throw it through the ropes and we both hit the top rope and everything spills out. I slide in, start hit with the weapons and we do all this stuff. And then at the end we look up and new Jack's at the top of the stage next to the camera, giving us the X, like the new Jack X. We start doing it back and we get to the back of the locker room. He goes, meanie. When you had trash can hit the top rope and all the way, I lost, you know, I, I lost my, I was like, only the blue meanie can, you know, fuck up like that and, you know, still get a pop and they just think, oh, that's just meanie. They think it was planned, you know, but New Jack <laughs> was always a meanie advocate, you know, and um, I'll always be a New Jack advocate, even though, you know, he's done some controversial things, but, you know, those things were done out of uh, him feeling he was disrespected, you know? Right absolutely i remember i remember one time jack calls me calls me on the phone okay to tell me he's lost (laughs) he's literally driving around and he's lost and he's like you got to help me find my way out of here and i'm like brother i'm in canada and we're on the phone together and i have no i like i have no idea where the hell you are yeah (laughs) and and literally i had to talk him through you know we're we're just we're just shooting the shit and talking so that he was like he was in the middle of nowhere didn't know where the fuck he was until he could find find his way out of there but that was that was always the kind of guy that like jack always had this persona 
right? That was mm-hmm. larger than life. And yes, you mentioned like he had done a couple of, you know, a few things that were less than desirable in other people's eyes or whatever, but it always came from a place where he felt like he was disrespected. But then there's the other side of a guy like that. And once you, once you meet people like that inside of the business, I think that's where you really get a chance to understand the human that is joined into the wrestling business. I want to ask you this. What was the, what was the best advice that you ever got from somebody, you know what I mean? When you first came in, when you first broke into the business, uh, and don't say, don't say get out of the business. Cause that's what everybody's fucking good. You know what I mean? (laughs) Because I I already paid him and and, uh, he got to train me. So (laughs) no, but, uh, you know, Al always taught me, uh, and this, if any aspiring pro wrestlers, there's two good pieces of advice, uh, mouth, mouth closed, ears open. Uh, always, no matter what show you're going to, always have your gear. Don't bring it in. Leave it in the car. Show up. Find a promoter. Introduce yourself to everybody. Uh, from the promoter to the ticket taker. Introduce yourself to everybody. And you find a promoter. Hey, I'm Brian. I know you. I'm sure you got a full card, but if there's a happen to be an opening, I have my stuff in the car, which got me on a lot of shows when I start wrestling on the East Coast with Dennis Coraluzo. Hey, Brian, uh, so-and-so stuck in traffic. You're on third. Go get your stuff. Okay, cool. And then um, a key piece of advice, uh, I'll say the phrase and then I'll explain it. Save it for the car. Save it. If you're angry or you feel disrespectful or you have a, a grievance and you, you need to get it off your chest, save it for the car when you're you're amongst the people you're traveling with you know just say it get it off your chest you know vent and then once you say it, you know maybe you think something differently but also if you say you're you know you're saying it in the say the locker room and oh somebody overhears it somebody takes that and they go to the person the promoter and they bury oh brian so-and-so is talking shit about you in the other room blah 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 this and that and the other thing uh m- more famously I was just thinking about this the other night. Uh, there's a famous incident where uh, Bam Bam Bigelow uh, wrestled Andre the Giant at Master Square Garden, and, and Andre just beat the tar out of Bam Bam. And getting a chance to talk to, get to know Bam Bam in ECW, he told me, I was like, I was just talking about, so, you know, something with dealing with the match with Andre. I can't remember what he told me what it was, but somehow either Andre overheard it or somebody stooged it off to Andre. Hence the match in the garden where Andre just, you know, beat him with an inch of his life. Just, you know, you keep your mouth, kid. you're new here, kid, you know? Uh, and that's why, you know, Bam Bam went away. And when he came back, he was a, a much different person. You know, he had, had matured a little bit, but you know, those, um, those, you know, key advices for any aspiring young wrestler, uh, you know, mouth closed, ears open, uh, always bring your gear, uh, save it for the car. Do you no matter- think though? Do you think though? And and the reason I say this is, society has changed. Of like course. you and I, you and I are cro- you know closely around the you know the same age. I'm not nearly as young as you are, but but we we were in the business. We broke into the business when those those phrases were like, that's the fucking Bible. Yeah. Like this is this is key. If you do not do this, you will not go anywhere in this. All right. Do you think it's lost on some of these kids nowadays, though? It it could be lost, but it's up to us to reinforce it. And uh, there needs to be enough enough vets. Or there should be vets around. You know, even if you're running an independent show and you have a group of young guys, pay a guy to come in and hang out in the locker room just to talk to the younger guys. Because mm-hmm. all the younger guys have are each other. And if they're all together, same experience level, they're all going to make the same mistakes together and not know any better. Whereas if you have like a veteran presence in the locker room, a guy who could pull somebody aside, not call somebody out in front of the locker room, pull a guy aside back. Hey man, you might not want to do that. Like either in the locker room or in the ring. Hey, this is what you did during your match. This was good. But next time, maybe try this. There needs to be more veterans around the younger talent. 
I mean, veterans that you can trust <laughs> to uh, give the right advice. You know, right. like, that person's track record and go, uh, him, not so much by him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have him around, you know, and I, you know, there's a lot of things I learned from Al and there's things, I, a lot of things I learned from, uh, you know, experience, yeah. good and bad. Yeah. That I try to pass on to the next generation and it's up to them to carry it forward. But, you know, uh, you know, getting back to, I, I forget the initial question, but yeah, you know, these things can be carried on, but it's our job to, uh, let them know what they're doing wrong and not, you know, hope osmosis takes over and they just learn it through mental telepathy. Yeah. We have to tell them yeah. these things. We have to show examples and not and just let them go out there and uh, flounder. And I think one of the biggest things for myself that I tell a lot of a lot of our kids um, nowadays and even just, you know, people breaking the business that for whatever reason ask me is I tell them all the same thing. Put on your shoes, put on your shoes and leave your house. You absolutely 100 percent like I can tell you stuff about what's happening around here and I can tell you, you know, my experience and stuff like that. But until you put on your shoes, leave your house, get on the road and start experiencing what other places, what other territories and what other workers and other vets in those territories and other green guys in those territories are all work, you know, working, learning and experiencing. You can't you can't really you can't judge any kind of level of success whatsoever until you've left. You can be the biggest fish, you know what I mean? In a small pond, but you know, as well as I do, you have to go out there and you have to put yourself in an uncomfortable position. It seems like by doing yeah. so, right. You have to be that, that guy who's walking into somebody else's locker room and not as an experienced guy, not as a guy who's been hired, you know, the marquee, not as the blue meanie or whatever, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. as the green guy, as yeah. the green guy who's still working, do you remember, and was there ever a time where, where you walked into a locker room and you just were not received whatsoever? And how did it make you feel? Did you feel like you had to go out there and prove yourself even more inside of the ring? Um, I was very fortunate that, um, you know, I trained with Al. And then Al got me all my initial bookings. Uh, I worked his school events. Uh, I would work for, he would, I would get booked for Sabu's events up in Michigan, Dan Severance uh, events up in Michigan. And then uh, Al started, you know, we started going over to, uh, start booking me out to Indiana for Mike Samples. And uh, every locker room I went into was always cool. But there's like maybe one instance where, I felt where I, not I felt I, where I was disrespected. And, um, there was a show in Pittsburgh, or I'm sorry, in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, which is technically, you know, sure. our North of Pittsburgh for, uh, Norm Connors. And, uh, earlier in the show, I wrestle a guy named Tex Monroe, who is uh, a student, uh, one of my classmates. And, um, we had the match, but my then uh, I had a tag partner at the time named Rick Matrix, and no, he was, Rick. yeah, <laughs> that's stories. Um, oh yeah, but he's married now. I can't say him out loud. Um, Rick Matrix is in the main event against I want to say against another one of our uh, classmates, Ray the Crippler Roberts, in the Newcastle Street fight. So I was instructed by the promoter to go out and be uh, Rick's corner man, you know, you know, help him cheat a little bit or you know, with this. So the, the crowd's rowdy. It's ruckus. They, you know, there, there's no barricade. So like the fans are like right on top of you. So this local indie guy uh, takes it upon himself to go out there and kind of be security for the event and hold you know, the, the, but like, I'm trying to do my thing as a wrestler and trying to cheat to get heat on the baby face, Ray Roberts to help Rick matrix. This guy takes it upon himself to grab me and like throw punches. I was like, I was like, what are you doing? You know, this, that, and the other thing, 
So we get back to the locker room and I, I am, I, I, I tried to be a cool guy. I tried to be a cool customer, but I got in the locker room and I was like, what the fuck was your pro? What, who told you to be? I picked up, <laughs> picked up a steel trash can and launched it across the locker room. And he just grabbed his stuff and left. I was like, what was he thinking? You know, Hey, who told you to be out there? And why, even if you're the, the local baby face, why would you put yourself out there to where you're going to have to interject yourself into the match? Nobody told you to be out there. No, and that's the one, the one of the few times like in my career where I didn't feel uncomfortable. I felt like super disrespected and stuff right. like that. You know, I mean, you know, and that was early on. And then, you know, and the promoter, uh, Norm Connor, you know, definitely cited, you know, he's like, I don't know what he was thinking, you know, so, but those things happen, but pretty much every locker room I've, I've been in has been okay. You know, I've, I, you know, some have been interesting where it's like, should I be here? Should I just pick up my bags and walk out? You know, right. you know I there, had, there I was had one, one of those. One. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. And then I, I want to hear your story, but like, there's one instance I had a booking here in Pennsylvania and you know, I get to the town, I get to the locker room. Uh, I'm, I'm watching, you know, people set up and all this stuff. And I, I, I sell my merch at the table and people are coming over and, and, you know, talking and stuff. So I'll go in the locker room. I sit down, put my bags down. A guy comes down, sits next to me who the guy I thought was a fan because he's at my merch table asking me like fanboy questions. And he sits down next to me. He goes, man, you and JBL, huh? And I was like, man, this guy's a worker and he's coming in the locker room and he's asking me these, you know, fanboy questions. I was two seconds from just picking up my bag, standing up and walking out. And this was after the promotion. It was like, yeah, we're going to have you go through a table. I was like, no, you're not. Uh, yeah, I come in, I'm the, I'm the comic relief. I come in, I lighten the mood. We have some fun. I might tickle. Yeah. I might do a little three stooges routine. And now we'll get the crowd dancing. We'll get the crowd cheering. And when I leave, then you could do all this. But they want me to go out there and do all this whole hardcore stuff because I was in ECW. I was like, did you watch ECW? Right. Show, show me how many hardcore things I did in ECW. And that was like one of the weirdest, weirder shows where I was just like, I'm about two seconds from just picking up my bag and walking out. But it, to me, it's all about, you know, uh, giving the fans the stuff they were promised. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I bit my, I bit my tongue. I didn't say anything. I just went, Oh yeah. <laughs> I give him the norm, norm McDonald laugh <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. and yeah, uh, yeah. got dressed, did the thing, got paid and lost. You know? There's, there's nothing. And it goes to show like what you were talking about earlier with these green guys, shut your mouth, open your ears, yeah. but, and, and, and you're not there. You have to remember, you're not there for the guys in the locker room. You're there to do a show for the people that have bought tickets with your face on the on the poster or whatever. So it's yeah. about them. So I, I get it. I had a I had, I've only had one incident where I've actually picked something up in the locker room and thrown it at somebody because of something that they fucking said. Yeah. And I was doing a we're doing a show and I'm doing a hardcore match. Um and we finished doing the I think it was me and it might have been Bill Scullion. Oh, I know at the time. Right. And, and we finished it and we go out there and we had done these, you know, a series of matches because up in, up in Canada, there was, there was a time where nobody else was, they wouldn't do the hardcore matches for whatever reason, because they, hmm. they didn't know how to do them. Right. You know, as well as I do, there is a, a specific nuance to being able to do matches like that without actually just being backyard and smashing yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you have to go out there and work the next day too. Like you got to exactly. do this on a consecutive. I can remember a time that I was, you know, working a tour and on this tour, I'm doing barbed wire matches in every city that we would go to. And I, we never touched the barbed wire once in any of the <laughs> fucking matches. Cause you have to be able to go out there and perform. Yeah. So we're doing this match and the two of us, we finished the match and I go back into the locker room and one of the vets, one of the older guys there is, you know, who was brought down, to do the show face on the poster and he looks at me you know as i'm sitting there and just kind of decompressing from everything after you do after a match you just you just need a minute you know just yeah. 
let me, let me, let me, let me decompress on everything. And, and then we can chat. All right. No problem. And he yells across the rock locker room, looks at me, goes, well, you guys just set the business back 25 years. And I was like, oh boy, I was like, I'm sorry, what? And he st starts bipping. And I was like, Brutus, I will beat your ass right here. And now with your fucking Motley crew, fucking tights on telling me I set the business back 25 years. And I pick up a chair and I launch it across the locker room at him. Right. And yes, when I say Brutus, it was beefcake. It was the yeah. only time ever that I've ever been just and, it was just, and it was one of these moments where it was like, okay, I know as a fucking, as a young guy in the business, I probably should have just kept my mouth shut. But at the end of the day, I'm still a grown ass man. And I'm, I literally just finished you doing know? what <laughs> you were booked to do to do. Yeah. That was, that was the thing. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. And you know, I, I apologized afterwards and we hashed it all out and stuff like that. But it was just one of those moments where it's like, you let your emotions get the best of you. Yeah. Right. In a lot of ways, I think that's where that whole uh, CM Punk thing went wrong. With right. The well, I, was just gonna, I was just going to ask you about that because this is one of those things where, you know, you have, you have a guy who's been in the business a very long time and you have a guy who hasn't been in the business, but is more, is more in the business on the, on the immediate, you know yeah. what I mean? Like punk punk's been in the business for years and years and years stepped away for a while. That doesn't take away from what he knows is in his knowledge and his status or anything like that. Right. And then you've got a guy like, you know, Jack Perry, who's, who's very out, out there every week. He's mm -hmm. very prominent with the people today and stuff like that, but that doesn't correlate to what happens behind the curtain. Yeah. Right. In your opinion, who do you think, was wrong uh i i'm when it comes to the whole situation i'm team punk right just for the fact that you know and that go a year before that with the the brawl out situation where he wins the belt he gets injured and then they have him go right to uh, do a press conference straight from the ring like you said there's a moment after a match where you have to decompress you have to sit there let the adrenaline wear off, calm down, react to what you did. So, you know, leading up to that, there was a whisper campaign that he was getting Cole Cabana fired from AEW, which Tony said wasn't true. And all these rumors were coming through wrestling media. So he goes and has this match. Oh, he, he's, he's confronted in a ring for shoot by Hangman Page, in a shoot promo by Hangman Page. On, you know, not knowing it was coming. Then he goes, has the match, wins the belt. I think he tore his tricep. And then he, he goes and does the uh, media scrum, comes right from the ring, right to the media scrum, injured, hungry, tired, angry. And when, for, what's the first thing he sees when he sits down? He sees a room full of the media, of the people who were, were doing the, the, the rumors, spreading the rumors of him trying to get, you know, Cole Cabana fired. So, of course, he's going to be full of emotion. And, you know, he's hungry, he's angry, he's tired, he's injured. Fuck it. He, you know, if they, now if they would have brought him out, let him go to the locker room, get showered up, get cleaned up, come in, maybe in a half hour, 45 minutes, fed, you know, showered, clean, off the adrenaline, he might have come in and it might have been a whole different situation. Now, yeah, and then fly back, you know, flash forward a year, almost a year to the date. The thing with Jack Perry, they want he wanted to use real glass in the locker room, which, you know, the office was like, no, uh, we don't want you to use, use real glass. Punk gets to the building and they say, hey, can you talk to him and, you know, make it make sense? Punk says, hey, we don't use real glass. And he's right. You shouldn't use real glass. It's unpredictable. You don't work right. with kids. You don't work kids, animals, or glass. You know. <laughs> um, so, and then you know, during the pay per view, Jack Perry puts his, you know, does the spot on the top of the car with the the windshield, taps on it, looks in the camera, goes, "Real glass, cry me a river." To me, that's just a, a shot across the bow. Yeah. Yeah. And again, they're doing a, they did Punk no favors back booking those matches back to back. There's no buffer in between. Yeah. 
you know, when the Rolling Stones go on tour, Mick and Keith don't see each other before they get on stage. Right. Mick's on one side of the stadium. Keith's on the other side of the stadium. When Van Halen was touring, the Van Halens were on one side of the stage. David Lee Roth is on the other side of the, oh, yeah. one side of the, you keep them apart. The Eagles Everybody. don't even travel together. I right. remember like the, they don't stay in the same hotels. They don't ride in, they've all got their individual buses, but that's not what people, you know what I mean? That's, that's their time. That's their stuff. When they're out there performing, that's what everybody should be concerned with. But everybody right. in this inside of this business, and I feel like it's one of the only businesses where everybody not in the business feels like they can be in the business. Do you think that's because it's been opened up? so much like you know what i mean we we've we've had no choice and i say we as 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 performers and as professional wrestlers we've had no choice but to kind of expose what we do to the trolls out there in the world because they're just so adamant and we get to the point where we're like look i'm gonna peel this fucking curtain back just a little bit for you to see that you're wrong right, right. in in your assessment of what we do is that our own fault Oh, people go, oh, it's fake. And we're exposing the business. Well, I mean, you could go through uh, time and look at, you know, back to the 20s, 40s, 60s, where people kind of knew wrestling was a work. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's not about the wrestling man at work. It's about disguising how it's worked. Yeah, it's it, disguising the trick. You could tell, you know, people are more sophisticated. Everybody knows the wrestling business is a work which surprised me when people still come up and go, Hey, was that real? But that's a sign of a good worker. It's, uh, it's up to us. And people go, kayfabe's dead. No, kayfabe ain't dead. There's a reason why 60,000 people travel from around the world to WrestleMania every year. Cause they want to see who wins and loses. Nobody knows who's winning and losing and they don't know how, and they don't want to know how, but, uh, you know, pro wrestling is probably one of the only businesses. And, and I mean, you can, you know, it's opened up a little, it's, it, it's been open because, you know, when you think back in the day, outlaw shows, you know, you have pro wrestling is one of the only businesses where you can buy a ring and just call yourself a wrestler. I can't buy gear and walk down to Lincoln financial field and get a couple reps with the Philadelphia Eagles. That's, that's not going to happen, but somehow in wrestling, somebody could show up and say they're a worker and get on the show. Dude, I would know? be so fucking hard if I ever had the opportunity to do that though, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Full disclosure. Uh, me and Ted are filled up Eagles. Fans. Yes. Yes. Full disclosure. Yes. I, I'm, playing to the, I'm playing to the judge here. On this. <laughs> we are, we are, we are up against the clock and I know that you are a very busy man. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, we are joined by the blue meanie here. Um, always a pleasure to get to talk to you every single chance that I get to, especially on Sundays. Now the football season is back, Go birds. Um, but we are talking a little bit of wrestling here and, I have mine. Like there's always a spot in a match. You always say there's, there's international spots and everybody knows about these things. And there's certain spots because we talk about how we've kind of opened up the door a little bit or open, pulled back the curtain. There's certain spots in wrestling that I, I personally can't fucking stand when I see them, but they seem to be, and, and it's for me, for me, it's that 10 punch in the corner. Right. When you're standing up on there and you're like, come on and 10 full on shots to the, to the melon. Yeah. Um, I hate it because of where we are in this, in society and, and MMA and all of this other stuff. I, I think, and I know that, I know that your, your trainer, Al Snow has, you know, gone on record many times saying the most fake thing that we do in professional wrestling is punch. Yeah. Right. You, you see guys trading punches back and forth in the center of the ring and, and, you know, they're doing these, these strong style spots or whatever. And for me, it's always been that spot, that 10 punch. I stopped doing it. People would be like, Oh, we can do the 10 punch in the corner. I said, cool. You want to do that? No problem. Here's how it's going to go. If I'm the baby face, if I'm up on top of you, I'm six foot four, 285 pounds. If I drop one shot on the top of your head, you're going to have a seat. I go, I'm going to hit you once and you're going to sit in the corner. 
And I'm going to stand up there on the second rope and I'm going to look out like, well, I guess he couldn't take 10 because to me, that seems like a much more realistic approach to that spot. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there a spot that whenever you see it inside of wrestling, it just makes you cringe just a little bit going, Oh man, I hate that spot so much. Uh, it's the one spot I see a lot and it, it, it wouldn't annoy me if it wasn't, if it didn't look so set up, but when they, the, there's a crowd of people on the, on the, the ground and they're all huddled <laughs> together and they're waiting for the guy to slowly <laughs> climb to the top rope, right? gain his balance. And meanwhile, they're all kind of like, uh, uh, and then, then the guy jumps yeah, where it's yeah. a, if the guy would just, you know, once they're up, the timing should be the group of people are down. They all get to a knee. They all get to their feet. And as they're leaving that one knee to the feet, the guy's got to be going over the top rope right then and there. Yeah. You can't have them come to their feet and then you start climbing. You got to, it's all about timing, you know, either do a springboard or, you know, when they're down, start climbing and when they get to that one knee as they're getting to their feet then dive but you see them in the in a rugby scrum you know going huh oh, where is he where is he oh there he is okay let's right <laughs> let's scurry over here and eventually uh, okay, it, looks here like we a, go. it looks like a fucking kumbaya circle they're all like got their arms around each other's shoulders and, and they're all looking up everybody's looking up at this guy like Oh my God, what do we do? Like the visual of this person, like it's the second coming of Christ and he's got everybody stunned into paralysis and nobody can move from where they, why not? If you've got that kind of time to watch the person move out the way, yeah. don't let them hit you. <laughs> I've done the spot where, uh, you know, so by I'll be in a tag match and somebody will bump out a guy will run, do a dive. That guy does a dive on those guys. And by the time it comes down to me, I get in the ring. I signaled that I'm going to dive. I hit the opposite rope. And then by the time I get to the other ones, they all scatter. And I just stand there going, ah, what the hell, man? <laughs> exactly. And he comes in and cuts me off, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Psychology. Yes. Psychology, right? Who'd have thunk it? Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. I, w I got one more question for you because sure. I know, and then we're going to wrap this whole thing up. But I know that you are and have done acting in the <laughs> past. Yes. For some horror movies. Yes. Right. You big horror movie buff? Uh, to a point. Okay. You know, uh, I know there's people who are deeper in it than I am. I, 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 I enjoy horror movies, but I'm not uh, a diehard. What's your favorite genre? You know, uh, I'll, you know, my favorite, well, you know, people will probably go, oh, poser. My favorite horror movie of all time is Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Uh, okay. Three more years. Is it because uh, of the soundtrack? Because, oh, yeah, the fucking docking, the docking, docking soundtrack. <laughs> I, I'm rocking with docking all day long, brother. <laughs> but me to too, me, brother. that was like one of the, one of the better. It was right on the border of it was still scary, and they were starting to introduce a little bit of humor into right into it. It wasn't like that first Nightmare on Elm Street scared me to death. Like I was afraid to go to you know you see his arms you know growing and you're like oh my god. It, it, I made the mistake of watching it at like 2 a.m. in the morning with all the lights out, you know. But, you know, Dream Warriors was right on that cusp where it was still scary. But, you know, there was a, uh, you know, they, they you know, welcome the prime time, bitch. You know, right. the and corniness the of, of the of the comic book, the comic book scene where, you know, everybody looks like they're in an aha video. Yes. Oh, <laughs> you know, yes. Yeah. So I get it. Awesome. You have any plans to do any acting in the future? Uh, if it's right, uh, I, I've been doing a lot. Of, I've been involved with a lot of documentaries. I'm a huge documentary buff. Uh, even if it's about paint drying, I can, I can sit there and watch a documentary on paint drying. Um, but you know, maybe down the line, I don't know. It's just, it just all depends on the schedule and, uh, you know, and timing, you know, the timing's key to everything. I, when, when I was doing those movies back in the day, it was just, the right time to do them and i had the time to do them and uh there are a lot of five you know you know shout out to len kabasinski out of uh erie pennsylvania who had me on a lot of his movies and uh gave me a chance to not only act but uh you know experiment experiment with something new you know now i know that 
I know that you are also a big comedian fan. <laughs> oh, I, know that, I, I know that you're a Carlin fan boy. He's my like, number one. Through through, uh, always. I mean, he's, he's top five for me as well. There's no doubt about it. His brilliance is unbelievable. Do you still listen to new comedians? I try to as much as I can. Um, you know, who, I, you, who are you hot on right now? Uh, Kyle Kinane's really good. Okay. Kyle, okay. He just he just released a new uh, special on YouTube for free. And uh, I, I forget. What, it's shocking something. Um, but it, he's he's right up there with... Like uh, like a sarcastic sure. type of humor. And, uh, I just, I just, he's, finished, like, he's a little bit punk rock, you know. I just finished watching uh, the second season of The Bear. Uh, if you've seen this or not, because I need know, to, I want it's, to. I've, dude, I've heard it's so it. good. We binged it. Uh, yeah. We totally binged two seasons, and in the second season, there is a there's a an episode where they're at a Christmas dinner. And one of the guys who shows up at the Christmas dinner, who's kind of forced into giving the, you know, giving the prayer for the Christmas dinner is John Mulaney. Oh, nice. And it is one of the greatest Christmas dinner scenes I've ever seen in my life. And I, I think John Mulaney is absolutely hilarious. Yeah. Uh, so if you get a chat, please do go watch the bear. You're going to fucking love it. And you just remind me, Tom Segura is probably up there. It's one of my favorite comedians right now. Just for, from, he still has that little bit of dark humor, which, right. you know, like a uh, bare naked lady said, I'm the kind of guy who laughs at a funeral, you know, this <laughs> kind of thing. But uh, yeah, yeah. He's got the right timing. He's got the right level of dark, but he, he's brilliant. He's brilliant. You know, I love it. I love it. So thank you so much. Brian, well, thank for you. Joining us. I, I appreciate this more than you will ever know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the blue meanie, Brian Heffron. Uh, where can people check you out? Where can they get in touch with you? Where can they send you love letters, dick pics, <laughs> uh, or oh, anything? <laughs> big fan of uh, Dick Van Patten. Um, if you would like to support the, if you would like to follow the Blue Meanie, you can follow me on all forms of social media: uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, kind of TikTok at Blue Meanie B W on all forms of social media. If you would like to support the Blue Meanie. Go to wrestlingtees.com slash blue meaning. Buy yourself a uh, snazzy little BWO shirt. Uh, I also have a podcast, Mind of the Meanie, uh, the Mind of the Meanie podcast, which drops, which drops every Monday morning, uh, wherever you get your favorite podcasts, or go to mindandmeanie.com. We talk about music, movies, sports, and tons of use of not tons of useless knowledge, kind of like this conversation right here, which is a lot of fun. Uh, me and Adam Adam Barnard, my co-host. I uh, have a lot of fun with that podcast, but uh, that's uh, that's all my vitals. You know, you, you mentioned TikTok and I'm surprised that we haven't and we need to start a campaign. I think that on TikTok, when all of the, the other dances are out there, there's no reason why the meanie dance should <laughs> not be a trending thing on TikTok. Yeah. Hell, if we just we just got a second emergence with Teenage Dirtbag being used so much on TikTok, I think we start the trend. Ladies and gentlemen, send in those videos, get those videos happening, yeah. doing that meanie dance on TikTok. Let is let's get this thing back and revitalized and uh and out there for everybody. Brian, yeah, thank you so much. I want to see the so best I want to see the best interpretations. That would be fantastic. I would have all of the, you know it would fuck up our algorithm so <laughs> badly. <laughs> Amazing. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Meanie. I appreciate you. Thank and, you, brother. Uh, nothing but respect. We'll be right back to close this whole thing up. Hey there, friends, listeners, and newcomers. This is Eric B., and I am the host of the Impactful Podcast. On the Impactful Podcast, we're going to break down everything Impact Wrestling each week. That includes everything that goes on in the background, everything that happens on TV, and everything that you're hearing on the news and social media. So please join me each week and live life impactfully.
And we are back on the law. Live audio wrestling. Oh, Chris, what an interview. I told you. How are you pulling this stuff out of these people? I told you. He is a... Well, uh, listen. When you can have conversations with people that you admire, people that you love, and people that you respect... It makes having that conversation that much better. And there is nobody on the planet that, you know, isn't a bigger baby face uh, in life than the blue meanie. So he makes it very easy. He's a very good, very good brother, uh, very good soul to talk to. So uh, listen, he'll be back on here many, many times before all of this is all said and done. So well, thank I- you. I enjoyed that interview. Uh, Thanks, I, just, I like real conversations. I'm sick of all the, hey, what did you do this week? And uh, you know how like. We so you're facing screaming Norman Smiley this weekend. Yeah, screaming. Norman Smiley. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows what you're referencing because I cut that out of the show. <laughs> <laughs> now, my friend, you got anything you want to plug uh, before we roll this ride out of here and leave these people to their wonderful Halloween? No, I'd like to shout out again the uh, our, our lovely, our lovely uh, Zane, who made that intro for us this week, and the this, outro, and the outro for us. Like, keep those things coming. This is fantastic uh, for myself. Like I said, you can send any kind of emails, any kind of suggestions, any kind of comments, uh, right directly to us by email, thelaw.liveaudiowrestling at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter. Please do so at the law wrestling uh, myself on Twitter, on Facebook, on threads. Sorry. I, oh, wow. I even said Twitter because I'm still not used to it. Sorry. Let me do that again on X, right? On threads, on X, on Donner, on Prancer, on Vixen, on Instagram. Uh, all of those places is at notorious TID. Uh, as well, you can go see any of my other stuff that I do uh, with any of the other shows, any of the other content. I'm over on YouTube at Tid Talk. That's T I D T A L K on YouTube. Uh, and uh, always, always, please thank you so much to all of you that have been supporting this on Spotify, on Apple iTunes, on all of your service providers, on SNME Radio. Please make sure that you check out all of those other shows on there, including the flagship show, including BAM, including the MLW shows, including the Impact Wrap-Up, including everything that you see on there. Please, (laughs) please. I got it. Impactful. Draw Straws Raw, the Smack Daddies. Check out Collision Catch-Up. Check out... AEW, I don't know. Check it all out, Just guys. Just run down the list, Radio. man. You're, you're not going to be disappointed. Thanks to the uh, Steve Swift's rambling reviews. you got to check uh, the phone. Yeah, I can't wait to have him back. back. On it. Yeah. I can't wait to have him back. we on. got Eric Reed and looking back on it. Uncle Bobby B is about to throw up a new thing. we got a whole bunch of stuff. SMNERadio.com or SMNERadio on any social media. You'll find it there. Big shouts out to the sponsors. Podplant.ca. Fan of tickets. Shouts out to THD, the handshaking team. SMNE Radio, yes. And shouts out to you, the listeners. Thank you very much for tuning into another episode, Chris. Take it away. So, with that said, thank you so much to everybody. Thank you so much to you, Brady. And for everybody out there, this is The Law Live Audio Wrestling. Make sure you tuck your chin. Thank you for listening to The Law, live audio wrestling with Chris Tidwell and Brady Weta. You can email any questions or comments to be read on air to thelaw.liveaudiowrestling at gmail.com.